All right, everybody, this is Ross Ratty, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast-style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night. Well, not every Wednesday night, but most Wednesday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern. Um, tonight we're doing it a bit early, and I think that's because uh, I didn't get a whole lot of sleep last night. So um, I do want to keep doing these live stream versions of the podcast. That's what we're doing tonight is actually... We're going to be live, and we are also going to be doing a Q&A at the end of the talk. Um, hopefully you guys follow me on social media of some form. I usually post something on the blog when we go live as well, but I think this time around I may not. Um, I think we'll do a simple message here on the uh, social media, Facebook and Instagram. We did let everybody know um the other day that on our social media and on YouTube that we are going to be live. So um, hopefully everybody got the message and uh, we can begin this episode. Um, yeah, so in this episode of Fruit Talk, we're going to be talking a lot about greenhouses specifically. And um, I also want to be talking about um, <clears throat> the frost that we've been getting here. And it seems like everything's all right with the stream, so I'm going to just continue on here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, so uh, if anyone's here joining me, just say hello in the chat just so uh, I know that everything's all right. Let me know how everything's going. But, um, yeah, so with everyone, that, everything that is going on in the, the world right now, it makes a lot of sense to do a live stream episode, doesn't it? A lot of you guys are home. A lot of us don't have anything to do. Um, there we go. We have one question so far. So if you have questions as we go along, um, I will get back to them in the beginning of the video. Or I will go back to them at the end of the video so that we can always uh, catch up on these questions that you guys might have. Um, but with everything that's going on in the world, like I said, I think today is and really the, the past couple of weeks have been such a good time to do something like this. Um, I don't know why it just hasn't been on my mind. I haven't really came up with some great topics that I've been wanting to discuss that I haven't already discussed in the podcast. I think if anybody out there has something, I did mention this on Facebook and Instagram. If you guys have a specific topic that you want me to cover, I'm all ears. I think, uh, as, a, as it stands right now, it's not that I am uh, losing passion for growing fruit um, or growing food, but it is beginning to that point where there's becoming less and less, obviously, that um, I can learn. Um, I think I've covered at least a lot of the bases, let's say, and... Um, there's obviously every there's so much you can learn as soon as you you learn you learn that you know obviously there's more that there's so much that you don't know right the more you know the more you realize you don't know so it's not like uh, I'm saying I know everything but um, the passion for learning and the curiosity that comes with all of this is diminishing because there's I think less of the new stuff out there you know what I mean it's not as new to me um, it's not as fresh you know, I've eaten a lot of this stuff at this point. Um, I've really gone in depth with the figs. I would like to go more in depth with different fruits, and we'll, you know, that time is going to come. Um, but as in, you know, just coming back to that point is that we kind of have lost some passion, I guess you could say, um, for growing food, just simply because there's nothing a whole lot new, and therefore I have less things to talk about on the podcast. I've found that when I am, um, you know, actually doing something um, and you guys are listening, it, it really beca is because I'm so passionate about what it is that I'm talking about. So uh, whatever it is that I, I'd like to talk about with you guys, I want to be excited. I want to have that passion because if I don't, um, it just seems like, well, what am I doing? You know? Um, so, all right, so that there's that. Um, if anybody has some interesting things, just let me know that we can cover on this on the podcast. You never know. There, there's something I probably haven't thought of, definitely haven't thought of, uh, that we could talk about. And also, I would just like to do the podcast more often. 
you know, as I said, there's some obstacles there, but um, I was very, very busy for a, a time there. I am still quite busy, but tax season has officially ended. Um, so I do have some free time, but a lot of my time is being devoted outside. We're still studying. So um, a lot of this is like, you know, uh, it's never really just chill and I can do anything I want. Um, yeah, so the, the point is, is that I would like to keep doing this. Whatever. Let's get on to <laughs> let's get on to what we want to talk about here. So for a lot of you guys who have been following along on the YouTube channel, you know that I have put a lot of time into these low tunnels. And first we had them like this. Um, I had the bare bones up for a while. It took me a while to get the plastic. Then I had actually um, two weeks, three weeks later, I finally received the plastic just because of what's going on. And, uh, you know, shipping things and ordering things has not been all that quick. Um, but I finally got it. But I also realized, wait, I have some plastic. Why don't I just throw the plastic on just to get a you know a head start? I was getting kind of antsy. In our last episode of Fruit Talk, we mentioned that, of how I didn't have the plastic and how I was really upset that I didn't have it and everything was kind of, you know, seemingly very stale in the season and slow in the season, where in all honesty, if I had the plastic, um, let's say by March 1st, not that's not when I ordered it, but that is when I would like to get this these things set up here in the in this climate to get the figs off to a really nice head start. And if that were the case, I would already have fruit on a lot of my trees in the ground. And I would be sitting here thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I'm going to have so much fruits this year, you know? And, um, I'm sure I will have a lot of fruits this year, but at the end of the day, uh, it just affected my frame of mind, I think, um, because I could have done better and I wasn't doing better. You know what I mean? So we finally got it. We got them set up, as you see here, and we've learned a lot. I mean, I went through different, you know, different t types of construction, different things that I've sort of pieced together to really understand, you know, what it is and how to do this correctly because there's so many methods of doing this and if you do one method it's not that one's wrong it's just that if you have a lot of wind or you have a lot of weather conditions of any kind you may want to do things slightly differently and um, so that's sort of the the process of what we went, we've been going through and then we went over to something like you know from also from this and you can see how much I had on the outside of the plastic. I really had to get every cinder block, most soil bags that I had and really place them around the edges to keep the plastic down because the plastic was just going off, right? It's not attached. You can see here, it really isn't attached because we had originally thought, I thought these clips, I have some clips here on this one and down at the bottom. I thought these clips would be enough and they're just not because the clips actually go through the plastic and create holes in the plastic. And obviously that's not a good thing. So then we upgraded and we went to something like this. And we have ourselves still on the ends, weighing it down on the ends, but we have this paracord line through the center. And this is really aiding in helping this plastic stay attached to the frame. There are some more additional things. You can see the soil here that's weighing down the, the plastic on the end. Weighing down the ends is so important, but also weighing it down, causing that depression that you see here at every hoop is so, so important for the wind. And so every, again, every single hoop has these, has the paracord that's tightened with a slip knot um, that's bolted into the PVC down below. Tomorrow's video is actually going to explain every little piece of the construction, I think, that went into this. I'm going to have, a, I think, a separate video after that describing all the common questions that I sort of ran into and all the common things that I think really are just going to arise if you're trying to do this. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the problems and things that really you should pay attention to because 
again, I just went through this. It's really fresh in my mind, and I think I have a lot to share on it. So um, finally, we got these things set up, and I have my temperature gauge that I normally have in the greenhouse. It's in this tunnel right here. And I actually think this one and even this one here, because of the angle and the direction they're facing, I think they're actually probably warmer than the tunnel right here. Um, but the tunnel that I have the thermometer in, believe it or not, it's at least a 20 degree, 20 degree difference um, from outdoors and what's inside the low tunnel. And I was sort of concerned. I wasn't too sure how this was really going to work because I have the greenhouse, but the greenhouse is different than this. It's in a different amount of sun. Um, it's in a different part of the yard. Um, it's a different construction. It's also smaller. It has a different angle. I mean, everything about it is so, so different. I have a heater in there. So I wasn't sure what really a big effect this was going to have, but I can really safely, I think, say, and I, I have to I have to adjust the thermometer tomorrow because the thermometer is on the ground and I think that might be affecting the temperature readings. Um, if I put it up, let's say up high, if I have it somehow on like a string and it's attached to the PVC and it's in like the top couple inches of the low tunnel, I would actually wager that it's a lot warmer in that section of the of the low tunnel than out on the than a lower point of the low tunnel. But the low tunnel at the on the ground at the ground level has all these stones and and rocks and things and bricks and those are really warm. So I think probably the best estimate I'm going to get is probably somewhere right above the ground level of what the temperature really is like in there at least because it really is a gradient scale of you know pretty high temperatures on the ground level then just above ground level it's significantly lower in temperature and then as you go up it gets higher and higher until you hit the top of the greenhouse or the top of the uh, the low tunnel so it's like that in my greenhouse as well because um, heat rises right so I'm still not totally sure but I do have a very strong hunch that even 20 degrees does not fully express how powerful these greenhouses, these low tunnels are. And, and I think the 20 degree difference, that was on a partly cloudy day, or mostly cloudy day. Um, you know, the sun was coming in every so often. Today, the sun has been shining all day. There's been a ton of wind. And as a result, the sides of the plastic are pretty rolled up a bit and there's a lot of air getting underneath um, the plastic but um, even with that even with that uh, you know that that air getting in there and it's not vacuum sealed because it, it was so windy right the wind is being dealt with with these paracord lines here and this depression in the plastic which is nice and necessary but these bricks you can see these bricks these will come off in times of very high wind um, and as a result a lot of air gets underneath here and uh, kind of cools things down so today I looked at it a couple times um, when it wasn't as windy and the greenhouse had pretty much been sealed tight it was a hundred degrees in the greenhouse when it was 60 degrees outside <laughs> or I should say it was a hundred degrees in the low tunnel 60 degrees outside so that's a 40 degree difference which is nuts um, again the thermometers on the ground on top of stones you know so I don't know if it's gonna be 40 degrees but that's you know I would I would guess it's probably somewhere in between the 20 and 40 that I've been seeing then uh, the air got underneath and it was 88 degrees it cooled down pretty fast um, so I don't know I really don't know what effect these things are gonna have but I'll, this is the point of the talk that I want to get into at least this section of the talk is that these greenhouses are are incredibly powerful I mean you know I just told you there's a 40 degree diff there was a 40 degree difference today 
at least at one point during the day. Um, that's insane, isn't it? I mean, isn't that crazy? Um, and the, the really the main message I want to put out to you guys is that to the people who have never had a greenhouse or have never had a low tunnel or some sort of plastic, because it really does warm things up so incredibly well that it's a complete game changer. I mean, the way that I have been thinking about growing food the last couple of weeks has been totally different than I ever have. And um, it started, of course, with the greenhouse. But then this year, I got the cold frame. If you guys remember the cold frame that I built, I think I have a photo of it in here. Yeah, here it is. So here's our cold frame right here. And the angle of the sun isn't perfect. It's a pretty heavy thing. It's a pain in the butt. Um, you know, even part of this is quite shaded. Um, so it's not the most ideal structure. But even with that structure right there, it was a night and day difference for things like my sugar snap peas and anything else that was growing in that, that cold frame. It was insane. So I said to myself, why am I building a cold frame, right? Why did I go through all the hassle? First off, it was a real pain in the butt to even get the whole thing right. I, it was a big learning experience. I enjoyed it. I think it's a great thing to have. Um, but the difference between like, let's say this cold frame and some mesh, I like to use that mesh that you guys know uh, that I like to use. I don't know if I even have a photo of it in here but the mesh has basically been over top of the crops. Yeah, I don't have a photo of it, but I've talked about it, where the mesh lies over top of the crops. A lot of market gardeners use it, and that, that warms the soil and the plants by like three to four to five degrees, and that's a pretty big deal. It's a really big deal. My arugula, for most of the year in this raised bed, had the mesh on it, and that stuff went bananas. Um, but I'll tell you this, the difference between that mesh and the cold frame is pretty big. And the difference between the cold frame and these low tunnels is also pretty big. So you're able, uh, the point really is just that you can think about growing food so, in such a different way because of these structures that really are not all that difficult to build. Anyone can do it. They're very affordable. I mean, a low tunnel, really is so so simple it's inc it's just insane um you could even have this structure here that i i put rebar into the ground slid the pvc over top of that um but you could like let's say because this is a raised bed i could put this on a hinge attach this the uh, pvc to the hinge and that wood and then that way i could just lift the hinge up anytime i want and then bring it back down um and that would probably be more ergonomic for a lot of people. Um, it would make a lot more sense for a lot more people. You know, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of possibilities, a lot of different ways you can go about this. And I just, I just cannot believe, I really cannot believe the results so far of these uh, low tunnels. Um, it really is quite shocking. And... I actually th I'm thinking that we're gonna I'm gonna have to find some way to actually keep them um, cooler like I actually think because if I go if I think about my greenhouse and my greenhouse in parts of May is super super warm I have to open up the doors the door I have to open up all the windows and then it becomes sort of manageable in there all summer long but even then, it's still very, very warm in, in the greenhouse. Um, if I'm not doing the same thing with these low tunnels, probably to an even higher degree, um, I'm I'm likely going to be regretting it. So um, that's how incredible these things are. That's how powerful these things are. Um, and I guess the other big benefit is, again, they are not really that big of an eyesore. I mean... This corner here doesn't look all that beautiful. It definitely would look more beautiful if it was just plants and foliage. 
I think this one looks pretty good. The one on the other, the west side of the house over here looks pretty good. But again, they're not going to be there forever. They're only going to be there for a short time. And that's really what their use is, is that season extension. So, um, yeah, I think what I ended up spending, and I, I think it's like a pretty good conservative estimate. I didn't add it all up recently because I, I put more cost into the into the structures. But I would imagine it's probably somewhere around $400 for 500 square feet of greenhouse, which is just insane. Um, we actually have somebody here from uh, Australia joining us. That's pretty cool, Peter. Thanks for joining us here. Um, Rocco's here, Tarek's here, Christopher, Chris, Daniel, what's going on everybody? Um, if you guys have questions as we go, we're going to answer them at the end of the video. Um, Peter, I want to ask you if, uh, because I'm doing this a bit earlier, if that's helping you join in on the live stream. And I thought maybe this time around, um, it would be better for you guys that live, let's say, on the West Coast, uh, probably not on the West Coast, but people who live in Europe, I thought doing this a bit earlier in the day, would uh, earlier than in the evening, would actually benefit you guys because maybe by the time it's 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you guys are probably asleep over in Europe. So um, I thought maybe this could help in uh, some people out by doing it earlier but also I'm really tired today and I'm gonna have to go to sleep I have an early bedtime tonight because um, this wind and this is the next sort of thing I want to talk about in this episode is the wind has really been crazy here but the frost has also been crazy here and it's really sort of stressed me out because um, there's a lot to cover um, I'm not covering everything um, I'm not protecting everything like I did that first night because that was probably the worst one that we had um, that we did that video on recently. But it is sort of stressing me out, especially with these low tunnels and how I had issues with the wind and we finally got them all straightened out. We were getting gusts here. Like there was a tornado watch the other day. Um, we had gusts today probably close to 30 miles an hour. Um, so things have been sort of nuts and, you know, a as a result, I've been not sleeping well because I, I really woke up like super early this morning because I heard the wind blowing and wanted to make sure that everything I had covered outside was still there, <laughs> that it did not blow away and all the fig trees that are outside didn't get hit by a frost. So me worrying I just inadvertently didn't get a whole lot of sleep today um, but that's sort of like you know it's really been insane this this just has been a very strange year and I have a feeling I mean I'm not a scientist and there's no way that I probably I think anybody can really prove it at least to what degree but it definitely seems like because nobody is driving or very few people are driving throughout the world, not just the United States, that it seems like uh, the earth has become significantly cooler. And I don't know if uh, that's just maybe how it is here and it's just like a chance thing. But you would think with all the less emissions that there are out there, um, that's affecting the greenhouse effects of the of the earth, right? There's a greenhouse effect with this plastic, guys, uh, and how powerful that is. It's the same thing with our ozone and the earth. So, um, you know, it just goes to show, I, I mean, I, I would be really interested to find out to what degree, and I even asked my brother what he thought about it, <clears throat> not that he studies this kind of stuff, but he is a doctor of chemistry. I figured what he would, if he had any sort of an idea, and he, he really couldn't come up with a number that was probably accurate. But I just have to think that that is somehow playing a part because we had such a mild winter. We've been going in the direction of getting warmer and warmer and warmer every year, um, at least over time, right? 
so we've been getting warmer. Then all of a sudden, uh, we stopped driving because of the coronavirus, and now um, it's super, super cold. And you would think this is actually sort of normal for April 22nd. I, I personally think this is sort of more along the lines of what Pennsylvania was like when I was a kid, as an example, or maybe when some of you guys were kids, you know, um, you know, people say this all the time, uh, old, the older generation is always talking about how things were so much colder when they were younger. And even the zones, the USDA zones have changed over time. Uh, I don't want to keep going on about global warming or climate change, but you know, it just goes to show that, uh, even without, let's say, man-made global warming, that the, even the USDA climate zones have changed. And, um, you know, it's just, it just seems to me like maybe this is more realistic of what things should be. And maybe we have all these unrealistic expectations of what the weather should be based off of what had happened so far this winter and this spring that it's making us all kind of think, oh, well, you know what? Spring's here already. I'm ready for summer, you know? And it's only April 22nd. How and on earth could anybody in this area, at least by me, or in the Northeast, how could any of us be thinking that summer is right around the corner? Um, it just isn't. It just is still a bit away. We still have a lot of spring left. And... Um, you know, it's it's it is a shame. I I would like summer to be around the corner. Um, yeah, but anyway, it's just a theory. It's just a thought. I wonder. I do wonder what that, if any effect has happened because of the fact that we're not driving as much. I really do wish that there was some magic ball we could just shake it and then get the answer. Uh, kind of like just googling something and finding it out. And I'm sure they may have some models out there that you could look at um i'm i'll be interested to find out when all this is over maybe even six months from now um when maybe the climate has sort of settled a bit what had really happened um if anything these past couple months and what will happen in the next couple months after after now um but the point is the and what i really want to get to here is the frost and how of course we've had so many of them we even had one last night we're going to have one potentially tonight we've had about four of them just in just since like april 15th i think um I, I think the first one was on the 17th here a lot of you guys in colder places than i had had frosts that were way earlier than me you know, uh, we all, as a result, the South, the Northeast, a lot of the country had a very mild winter and therefore had a very early spring. And we're all in the same boat. It's not like anyone's really uh, somehow escaping all of this, but the people in the Northeast are really paying, I think, the most, uh, or at least definitely more than people in the South because. The South, yeah, they're they're already way ahead of us, but um, they're probably on that edge of getting a frost and not getting a frost, and it's probably more likely that they're not. You know, me, I'm right on that edge as well, and I'm in the Northeast, right? So um, the you know people who are north of me, I just think, wow, you guys must be really in a world of hurt because it it really has been sort of nuts since really all of April has been kind of crazy for you guys. Um, you know, 40 degrees here at night uh, may spell frost for you guys, let's say somewhere in New York, you know. So even west of me in Bethlehem, Lancaster, you know, that's only an hour, an hour and a half west of me. And those places are getting hammered. Um, the only reason I'm lucky is because I'm near the Delaware. So it kind of just makes you think, right? 
a year like this where you're not really supposed to have something like this happen. Maybe 100 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. I don't know, okay? I'm not a, uh, a weatherman, right? I'm not a, a historian when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, but the point is, is that, you know, maybe the, the temperatures as they are right now were normal then, um, but it's not normal for now. And because of how everything happened and the in the dura- and the sequence it all happened, we're just not looking good. And th- and this you know having so many frosts in April is just it seems unheard of. It just seems crazy to me. I have been since I've been growing now. Every year it just seems like to me that things are getting um, not necessarily earlier, but without a doubt any frost whatsoever in the month of April is really unheard of, at least here, right? Our average last frost, if I look up my, on the USDA or the farmer's almanac, and I look at my location, and I see what my average last frost is, my average first frost, my USDA climate zone, um, it's going to tell you that on average, it's somewhere between the 21st of April and May 1st. And May 1st is probably a good date. Now, I remember, I think it was maybe three or four years ago. I remember even, I think it was even last year that the Northeast got hit by a late frost in the month of April. Here, nothing happened. Um, It wasn't significant enough. It wasn't severe enough. I didn't think it was, we were even going to come close to having a frost so I didn't do anything, um, but I think parts of the Northeast got hit, for sure. As bad as it was on the 17th, no. Um, I think three or four years ago, something happened that was similar as well, and I had said to myself then, I don't want to have to do this fig shuffle of bringing the figs in and bringing them out. It's a lot of work, and I just want to have them out. If they're out, they're out. If they're in, they're in, right? So... You know, that was enough for me, but most of the years that I have been growing, we haven't had a frost of any kind in the month of April. Um, So again, these are averages. It's not always going to work out every year like this, but, you know, it definitely seemed like for a while that things were even changing significantly, um, you know, towards something uh, a lot more mild here. Like it felt like I was living at least a little bit further south than I was. And um, yeah, it just, I guess the, you know, the intuition of just growing and things like that, there's really no science behind it. But um, that's definitely how I felt. And this year you could say, you know, what the heck, right? I mean, how do we ever, in any sense, get through this? Um, So luckily, some of you guys, and I've actually, um, I've had this before where, um, let's see here. I have this critical temperature chart that I've actually shown you guys in prior years. Then other people had messaged me. There was somebody on Facebook. I know my friend Steve messaged me. Um, this chart, I've seen this on growing fruit originally where this is, I I think I even came across this thing, but this really clearly laid out how simple this is and how I really shouldn't have worried as crazy as I did on the 17th, because we got down to 28, but we were at 28, maybe 29 for a very short period of time. And as you can see, just looking at this chart, the apples, the pears, the apricots, the cherries, the nectarines, the plums, all of it, you only lose about you know 10% of your flowers and your fruit set um, at 28 degrees, which is in, in no way a bad thing. <laughs> it's probably a nice thing because it's really helping me thin out my fruits <laughs> anyway, right? Um, I didn't actually see any of that by the way, I don't even know if it was enough 
if it was a critical enough temperature to even lose 1% of my flowers um, or my fruit set. But I will tell you that there was some damage on my apricots because my apricots and my plums have already set their fruit. The Even the peaches have set their fruit to some degree. But the apricots have pretty decently sized fruits on them, like the size of, I guess, a penny. Um, and maybe even a little bit larger than that. So if you have an apricot that's the size of a penny and it gets hit with a frost like this, 28 degrees, what is the critical temperature for something like that? And it doesn't say on this chart. And I've learned that it's not 28 degrees. <laughs> it's not uh, very good for, I think, really all of your fruit that has set. It seems like my plums are okay, but maybe it's because they're so small and they're still very young. But uh, the apricots, as an example, they're, they got blasted. And I may only have one or two apricots the whole year. Not that I was going to get many to begin with, but I'll be lucky to even have one. And, um, you know, it just goes to show you that some of these things here, especially on this list, the apples, the pears, the stone fruits, are just not something that's really recommended for this climate because of the frost, because we typically we do get late frost this late is unusual this many this late is unusual but um you know a lot of people have said to me and i know a lot of people who live in a, a you know nearby they don't live too far away um and they're lucky to get an, a crop of apples or a crop of stone fruits you know they may lose their crop two out of five years um so it really does depend on where you live and what you're growing. And I think that's sort of what I want to cover in this, this video here is what it is that I recommend for the, the uh, just a situation like this. What should you be growing? And also, what am I kind of straying away from? Now, we did do an episode of Fruit Talk almost an entire year ago. We did it last June. And we talked about what my favorite fruits to grow are and also um, what I'm getting rid of or at least what I'm moving towards in a certain direction. Um, so I don't want a repeat of that, but my opinions have slightly changed. And most of this is kind of a, is just a simple change towards away from things like red currants. Um, I'm not a big fan of the red currant in terms of the jam. I know I still have to wait and really experience some black currant jam. Um, as I was making some jams, we made a fig jam recently, we made it a red currant jam recently, we made some strawberry jam recently. I've got a lot of jam, okay? And some of it didn't end up working out all that well because I made a few mistakes here and there, but that's just on me. But the point is, is that you can only eat so much jam, guys. Um, there's other things you can do with some of these things, like, uh, you know, making syrups. Um, I had myself a mulberry syrup that my buddy Romeo, his wife, made for me. Uh, he gave me a jar of that stuff. Incredible. Um, I had that stuff on my pancakes. Just bar none, best syrup I've ever had. Um, Obviously, there's some really high quality jams you can make. You can do yourself a wine. I think I want to do a wine, at least experiment with something like that. You know, um, I'm sure it's not going to be incredible. I'm sure it's going to take a while. Um, but things like the red currant, I'm not too keen on because you have to process them in some way. And if they're not the king of that particular way of processing them, I don't really see a whole point. I actually do enjoy the red currant fresh. It's not a bad fruit to eat fresh, but the birds love it. You have to net it. Um, it just, in a sense, is kind of a pain in the butt to grow. Um, but maybe that's just me. I, I don't mean to 
put it down too much, but it's one of them things that I'm kind of straying away from slightly. Another thing I'm straying away from is the the Bing type cherries. So, you know, my white gold cherry, my black gold cherry, um, they're putting out really not a great fruit set this year. Um, we're still building the structure of these trees. It's really been a shame how they've sort of just been kind of meh because of how I pruned them when they were young. Um, but overall, they're very difficult to grow. And well, so far they haven't been all that difficult to grow. But the fact that they are a stone fruit and they do flower quite early, and if temperatures did get down below 28, I would have lost all my cherries, right? So um, what's something that I actually recommend more is actually the bush cherry. And we've talked about how I didn't like the bush cherry. We talked about how I recommended it. Then I didn't like it. Now I'm recommending it again. And... Um, yeah, it just seems like uh, actually a cherry that's actually quite good. And you can net them. They're very compact. They're quite beautiful. They're very problem free. Um, it just seems like a much better alternative. So, you know, that's sort of it in terms of what I'm straying away from. We added the elderberry this year. We added the, the quince. The quince makes supposed to be like the best jam, right? The uh, Or even a paste. The elderberry is great for juicing. I'm going to be definitely doing some juicing. Maybe I'll do that for a number of these fruits if, you know, I don't necessarily want to process them into, into jam. Because my favorite jam of all of them so far is the blueberry jam. Um, I also really like fig jam. Um, strawberry jam is wonderful. But of those three, you know, I'm sure you could get even more creative. I would love to have like an apricot jam. I'd love to have a number of different jams, mulberry jam. I mean, but again, how much jam can you eat? You know, um, I don't even like really eating jam all that much anymore because it's so sugary. Um, and you have to eat it on something like bread, which I'm not really a big fan of eating bread that much anymore. Um, it's just something that is not really in my, my diet as much anymore. So I have to find some other use for these things. Otherwise, I'm sort of weighing my options here and wondering maybe I should just throw something else, you know? Um, so yeah, that's sort of what we're getting to. Like I, I think um, a number of these fruits are fantastic fresh. Some of them are just something that you wouldn't choose to eat it fresh over something else. Not that you wouldn't, you know, I like eating the red currants, but around the red currant time, there's other fruits to be eaten. And um, I may not want to eat some red currants. I may only want to just graze on them here and there, call it a day, you know, rather than having pounds of fruit of red currants. Um, you know, I had probably close to four pounds of red currants last year. Um, so, and they're getting even better this year. I mean, the, you know, it's just going to be insane. So, yeah, I think we're going to have to find some uses for this stuff. And I'm, I'm very interested, like, uh, you know, let's see here. So the honeyberries, I think, is one of the more interesting things to process in some way. I'm, I don't know exactly what I'll do with them, but I haven't even gotten enough in any degree to process them. It's just that's that thought's too far away just yet. Um, the black currant, I would like to make jam just to see what that's like. It's supposed to make the best jam. People have said quince and black currant jam. Uh, I don't know. But you know what? A, a black currant wine wouldn't be all that bad, or a red currant wine wouldn't be all that bad, or, you know, I'm sure there's something I could do with them in some way. Um, but that would be my probably my second best option, or at least what I would go to next. You know, the let's see what else we got here that you have to process in some way. Goji berries we got rid of, guys. I don't know if I if I mentioned that yet. They're just so disgusting that you'd have to dry them and add a lot of sugar, and I didn't want to have to 
go through all that work. It's such a small fruit. Um, let's see here. The blueberry is a fruit that I actually originally intended to process, to grow, to process into jam. Cause I had such an incredible blueberry jam one time that it blew my mind. Um, and that actually made me grow blueberries, that jam. So I am sort of growing blueberries for jam, though I do eat them fresh as well. You guys should see my blueberries this year, by the way. They're, they're out of control. I mean, the production on those things is nuts. It's absolutely crazy. Um, that's sort of it for some reason on this list. There's not a whole lot else that I have that you have to process. The quince for like jam, the elderberry for juicing, and maybe for a wine. The flowers, you can use it for other purposes as well. So really it just comes down to, I think, the honeyberries and the red currants and the black currants. What do I do with these things, you know? Uh, so they're, mm, they're becoming on the chopping block, let's say. I'm not going to rip them out, but don't be surprised this fall if I end up ripping out a red currant or two and put something else in it in its place. So, all right. So now let's go back to the things that I want to grow or you should grow if you're going to have these late frosts. Um, so clearly the stone fruits are out, the apples, the pears are out, although I think apples are pretty good here. They seem to be all right because um, the pears bloomed before the apples, but all the stone fruits bloomed before the apples. There seems to be some very late blooming apples as well. And that is something really worth looking into. So I don't want to completely write off apples. Um, there's also late blooming of everything, you know, of all the stone fruits and all the pears. But, you know, it seems more apparent, at least to me thus far, and, and judging on what I grow is the apples, that there's a lot more of them are, are quite late blooming um, compared to some other things. And also, you know, we needed some something really significant. We needed, we didn't really need something any more extreme than what we currently already had. Because at the time on the 17th of, of April, really only a week ago, we had this 28 degrees. Uh, but if we got down to, let's say, 25, that's only a three degree difference. I would have been looking at a much different story of what I'm going to be actually be able to eat this year. So, we got lucky, I think. And anything, the plums, I have a feeling, and the apricots in the future, that probably will be a two out of five year thing where I just won't get a crop two out of five years. Um, and it seems to maybe be only getting worse, potentially. Um, so I would say if you are going to grow a stone fruit or one of the palm fruits, go with the, the apples and go with something that's a little bit later to bloom like um actually believe it or not my cherries were the latest to bloom out of all of my stone fruits which is kind of nuts um some other things i'd recommend for a late frost type scenario is the blackberry the raspberry by the way we got rid of our primark freedom i just don't have a great spot for it and we planted where they were figs. And I don't regret that at all. I do love the blackberries. But we went with now a Marion berry. And this is the type of blackberry. It's a cross that is supposed to be really good, number one. We've talked about it in the past. It's not very hardy, so I have to cover it with some wood chips. But the nice thing about it is that it... Um, will produce earlier in the season because um, it produces on that um, on the second year canes so I guess in a sense that's not really good for a potential frost um, or a hard freeze because the things like the raspberries are really good because I grow my raspberries not for the first crop but for the primocane crop, right? The floricanes is that two-year-old cane that fruits early in the season. That's always a very minimal crop. Um, 
it does fruit, but the birds get a lot of them and I don't protect them and it's not really worth it. So I end up sometimes, I, last year I even took off the flowers. Then you end up getting a huge crop at the end of the season from really from sometime in July, maybe even beginning of August um, till frost where you just get nonstop raspberries. That right there is unstoppable. That will always happen, right? So something like a raspberry or a primocane blackberry is probably something that you really want to look into. Um, now it's possible that the blueberries are even hardier than what's on this list here. Like this, these critical temperatures. I don't know the exact data on that, but I have a feeling if I had a guess, I would guess that the blueberries are hardier than the palm fruits and the stone fruits. By how much? Probably not all that much. Um, the strawberry, that's another thing that is constantly overlooked. And I swear, I just harp and harp and harp on these strawberries. And I feel like nobody listens. <laughs> there is such, they are such an incredibly good fruit. The Mara de Bois strawberry is such an incredible piece of fruit and it's there every single year in huge quantities that it just doesn't make sense not to grow it just just blows my mind between the raspberries and the strawberries they're probably your safest bet out of everything and they're also like the easiest to grow and you get so much food out of them that you never in your life, unless you guys live in a place where you just can't grow anything, should you ever, ever, <laughs> it's legitimately getting to that point, I cannot eat a store-bought strawberry. I can sort of eat a store-bought raspberry. It's, it's sort of like in the wintertime, or let's say at a time of the year where there is nothing and you could eat a, a store-bought raspberry. But does it make sense? Absolutely not to buy them. Absolutely not. Um, the Alpine strawberry, another one that's good to grow. The mulberry here is proving to be very good to grow in these frost situations. And the reason for that is that I have a if you find the right species and the right variety of mulberry, you will have a mulberry that doesn't wake up too soon. Um, what is that species of mulberry? Um, I'm blanking on the species name here. I think it's a Morris Alba here is what you really want to look for. It's either the, I think it's the red mulberry. Um, yeah. So like a variety like Illinois Everbearing, as an example, doesn't wake up too soon. Um, that's another key thing here. Either it can withstand a frost and the fruit will still appear. Even if it did get hit by a frost, the fruit's going to happen anyway. Or it just needs to be in a situation where it's going to wake up late. Therefore, no matter how mild the spring is or how mild the summer is, you're going to be guaranteed this particular thing every single year. So what is that thing, uh, that mulberry here? So I, like I said, the red mulberry, I have some seedlings that I'm going to be grafting Girardi onto this year. I grafted Girardi last year onto my Illinois Everbearing, but some birds broke the graft. It was a really dis disappointment because I even had a graft that I never had did before, the bark graft, and it succeeded my first time ever doing it. So I thought, wow, that was pretty cool. Um, but it got broken. So um, yeah, I think Illinois Everbearing is a wonderful one. It just grows too quickly here, and that's why I don't have it. But something around that right, that right species and the right variety, because if you have the wrong variety of mulberry, I've had other varieties that I've tried. It's not just the Illinois Everbearing that I've grown here. Um, I don't remember exactly what the name of it was. But some other ones, and other people have reported a similar thing. People have a similar situation with the Pakistan types, with the 
with a different type of a different species. I forget the name of the species, but I guess it's the black mulberry. Um, Morris rubra, I think, is the other one. There's alba and rubra. Um, but anyway, if you have the wrong mixture of the two species, sometimes you can have a hybrid. Sometimes you can just have a bad variety. Some of these varieties are not adapted to this location all that well, and they wake up as one of the first things to wake up. They're like as bad as the stone fruits. They're as bad as the apricots. So if you're thinking about growing a mulberry, you got to find the right one. And it, and uh, that way they will actually wake up a lot later. So I, you may I like I said I, the reason I wanted to specify that is because you may have friends or even people who have told you this. Oh, my mulberry wakes up super early. Um, you know that's not true, but it is true if you have the wrong one. So you got to be careful. That's all I'm saying. Um, all right. So another thing actually that would work out well is the goji berry. <laughs> Not that I'm going to be growing that. Um, the grapes, the European grapes seem to be all right. Um, they are leafing out right now as we speak, and the leaves, the branches, will eventually have fruit on them. That new growth is where the fruit will be. So if you somehow kill that new growth, you lose the fruit. And that, to me, uh, is risk with something like the mulberry as well, something like the persimmon, and also something like the fig. However, it seems like the European grapes wake up late enough, the mulberry wakes up late enough, the persimmon wakes up late enough, and the figs wake up late enough, to the point where you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to avoid that, that frost. Also, the jujubes, uh, the jujubes for sure. So those are a number of fruits right there that you can grow, no problem. And that is why my friend Bass, who lives in Bethlehem, if you ever go to his yard and you figure and you see what he's growing and you ask Bass, who has grown every fruit probably you can grow here at one point at his old property, although I didn't know him and I never I've never been to his old property. Um, I didn't know him then, but um, I asked him one one year at his gathering in June and I said Bass you know I see you're growing all these different fruits uh, but specifically only a few types why is that oh well they're mostly problem free here um, in terms of diseases and also they are good with the frost so that's really a big one I mean he's in the pawpaw which is not one of them that checks that frost box off but uh, yeah, he is. He's got things in his yard like an Illinois Everbearing, you know. Um, actually, I don't even remember if he has a persimmon tree or not, which is really quite shocking if he doesn't. He has uh, jujubes. He's got figs. Um, he's got his pawpaws. So you know, it's a it's a mixture there of things that definitely would do well. Um, he also has, I think, a peach and an apricot. But the bulk of it uh, seems like things that will do well in this location, at least with the disease part of it as well. And I don't want to speak for bass, but that's that's what I've gathered. Um, <clears throat> so let's see here. What else we got? Um, so I would say the European grape's pretty good. And I would also throw in there... That's it. That's about it. Because the pomegranate wakes up quite early, quite easily. Um, and if it gets hit by a strong frost, it's already leafed out pretty significantly. You'll lose a lot off of your tree. You won't get fruit that year. Or it's very, very unlikely you'll get a lot of fruit. Um, the honeyberries flower very early. The berries, the gooseberries, and the currants seem to flower all around the same time. And, you know, therefore, they uh, are not the latest things, but they're not the earliest things. I'd say they're smack dab in the middle. So there it is. I think that really sums it up for this episode of Fruit Talk. You know, we talked about, again, 
um, my greenhouse recommendations, what everything was going on with these low tunnels, how big of a difference it really is. I mean, it's just something you got to try. We talked about the frost. We talked about <laughs> the fact that nobody's driving and how I'm not a scientist. Um, we talked about these critical temperatures here. And then, of course, what would be something good to grow in uh, a climate like this one. So I want to get now to all the questions and everything that you guys have been saying in chat here. And uh, yeah, so let's do that now. Because we're gonna do that Q and A, as I mentioned. Um, so if you guys have questions, let's do it. You know, um, I'm probably gonna give this uh, this live stream another about twenty to thirty minutes. Um, we'll see how long I can last because, uh, as I said, I am very tired. But I do like these um, these live streams. I always look forward to this part here, guys. So Daniel says, hey, Ross, uh, your thoughts on hydrogen peroxide to kill root fungus or leaf fungus? Um, I haven't really needed it. I think that was something that a lot of people recommended and I looked into when I first started. And then I never really looked back and never it was never something that I thought had any good benefit to it or not. So I really can't answer that question. I know that's what its purpose is. Um, but I don't think you really, if you're doing everything right, you shouldn't really need that. Um, Chris says, hey man, uh, the tunnels look great. Thanks, Chris. What's going on, buddy? Tarek, what's going on? Uh, Christopher, what's going on? <laughs> Rocco said, hey, Ross, uh, looks like too much work off and on, especially if it's windy. But you're a lot younger than me. I'm 63 and lazy. Keep trying different stuff. Uh, it's fun. You'll eventually find what works. Yeah. That was a good uh, good thought there, Rocco. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'm able to do some things that other people aren't because I'm, I'm younger. Um, hopefully, by the time I'm 63, I'll be doing them as well. So to all of you guys who are thinking that I'm young and you're not, you know, you can do this stuff too. You just gotta, uh, you just gotta get out there and move around, stay active your whole life. I don't know if I told you guys this, but my grandparents are 80, 87, I think my grandfather's 87. Uh, very Italian guy. He's the old Italian man that I was telling you guys about with the propagation methods, and he, um, <clears throat> he and my grandmother. Both play tennis every day of their lives um, in Florida. Obviously, they live in a place where they can do that, but just because you're 87 doesn't mean you have to do nothing, you know? All right, Peter uh, is from Australia. You guys have so many varieties of figs over there in the United States. It's true. Um, it seems like you guys have a number of varieties um, in Australia as well. He said also that he's having breakfast. He was alerted um, because of the broadcast. I wish I could acquire a lot of varieties you guys have over there. Yeah, I. you know what's interesting though, Peter, is that a lot of ours have immigrated over from Europe, um, maybe even some from the Middle East, very few probably from Asia. Um, but because we had so many immigrants from Europe, uh, that really helped. I know you guys did as well. Um, but to be honest with you, um, you guys live in a place, at least parts of Australia, that have the fig wasp. I've been seeing a lot of photos on Facebook, different Facebook groups. There are some uh, Australian collectors that have some pretty interesting looking figs. So. You just got to know somebody and also go out looking for new varieties of figs. These wild figs are pretty interesting. The people in California are doing the same thing and they're coming back with some pretty good stuff. Um, so yeah, don't be too jealous. Christian said, uh, hey Ross, glad your stuff survived. Yeah, I'm glad too. Some of it did take some damage, but very little. A few figs at my aunt's in New Jersey got fried, but in New York City they did fine. That's that's a shame. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I got really close to some of this stuff uh, getting fried, and if I didn't cover at least the potted tr fig trees, they would have got blasted. The in-ground trees that did leaf out to enough of a degree that I thought I should worry, I did protect those for the most part. There was one or two that I missed, and those took some damage, actually. And it was also different parts of the yard that took damage more than others, um, which of course is because of the, you know, microclimates and things like that. All right, so uh, Tarek said it's snowing in Northeast Ohio, just contributing to how cold it's been. That's a shame. Um, Pamela said, hey Ross, here in the Caribbean, it's extremely hot at this time of year. Is it? I guess it's hot. Is it hot there all the time? I mean, you guys are pretty close to the equator, right? Mr. Green, what's going on? Uh, the wind on Monday was insane. It was insane. Whoa, you had seven pine trees and your block fall down. We got hit with something bad. I never felt my house move like that. The news came by to talk to a few, a few people and film the devastation. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, there was a tornado warning that went all the way up 95, basically. Um, I-95, anything in that track all the way up north just got smashed with wind and hail. It was hailing here. It was 60 degrees outside. Then it's just giant amounts of wind came through, and I had a ton of hail come through, which then cooled the temperatures down to like 50. Um, and then it stopped hailing, and then we had a frost that night. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. It was actually pretty big pieces of hail too. It wasn't like a, you know, a little bit of ice. It was, it, it hailed for a decently long time here. Vivian, hello. Uh, let's see here. We have a mild winter, Vivian said, and not so warm spring. Our nighttime temperature not freezing, but it's only around six to eight degrees Celsius. Frost in April is not good. No, it's not. Yeah, I think a lot of people are in a similar boat. Mild winter, poor spring so far. She said that our figs never leafed out until mid-May. Wow. So I've actually, I'm not complaining in any sense because I like to get the figs awake and activated earlier in the year, as I tell you guys all the time, April 15th, get them awake, or 15 days before your average last frost. Because to have a frost like this 15 days before your average last frost is pretty unlikely. Um, and if the worst case scenario, you do get a frost like I've been doing, you can cover them. And it's just not a big deal. And at least this way, they are doing something. And um, it's not like it's the end of the world. Okay, Peter Quinn, uh, no, he said that already. I already mentioned that. Okay, uh, Mr. Green said, we were above average temp-wise, now we're way under average. It's been a huge swing, not good for anything. Yeah, it really isn't. We were, we were above average, you're right. You're exactly right. We were above average, and now we're just like, you know? And that's why I think something happened, right? I don't know what it was. To be doing so great, all the way up here, and then to just fall off a cliff with the weather. It just seems unusual, and to me, it just feels like it's got to have something to do with the driving, right? I mean, that's the only thing that's changed. Of course, it could just be random. <laughs> it could just be <laughs> that's just what happened, but uh, I would, I would just, like I said, really like to know what effect the driving had on this whole weather situation, if any. Pamela said the weather pattern change all over the world due to climate change. Yeah. Um, Mr. Green, plum blossoms seem more cold hardy than apples. Interesting. The only issue with that is that the plum blossoms blossom, they bloom way before the apples do, at least here. Uh, which is really the unfortunate thing about them. Um, Nick, what's going on, buddy? The spring's been tough. March was warmer than April. Crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not like I'm. To- this is like totally un- unexpected either, because the weather, as you guys know, in the Northeast is insane. One day it could be 80 degrees, the next day it could be 40. I mean, you guys know how this works. We've always been in this climate, right? It snows in March. It is. It is. Um, it has snowed in before Halloween. Before. Um, I mean, it's just crazy. Um, Norrin Davis said, I live in Texas and I've heard from a couple people that they had in-ground figs actually die in a really hot summer. What are some ways to protect your trees from that? That sounds really unlikely. And um, I guess you just have to water them. Now, temperatures about at 120, you're going to start to see your figs not really responding well. And they're not going to be very happy at around 120. Um, I have had them in the greenhouse at 130 and they really looked upset. Um, At 110 they seem like everything's all right. So they're not loving life but they're dealing with it all right and I just think that's pretty unlikely. I mean putting mulch down on the soil if temperatures if the root temperatures are above 95 you should have some mulch on top of the soil any kind of water and he said that strawberry uh, rhubarb jam is uh i guess it's good then huh you know i've never had a rhubarb jam before and i wonder if it's really all that good i know the strawberry and the rhubarb are supposed to go well together right pamela said you can make wine i can it'll be an interesting thing i think that's an interesting um thing to try and learn how to do I've already know how to make kombucha, so it's got to be rather similar, right? Mr. Green, I'd like to hear about different uses for our fruits. Yeah, me too. Um, I would like to experiment more with that, but a lot of time my focus and energy goes towards eating the fruits fresh and not processing them enough. You also dumped your goji berries. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. Um yeah oh Pamela I do also dry them I forgot about drying them Um, but we do a lot of dried fruit here I do enjoy dried fruit quite a bit and especially having them all winter time that's really awesome I like the persimmons for that purpose is making that hoshigaki that was just unreal those dried persimmons are incredible Norrin said that my blueberries are loaded with berries you could fit more berries on most of them Um, You couldn't fit more berries on most of them, even if you tried. Awesome. Jersey Bob. A lot of comments from Jersey Bob. Fuji apples are still in bloom. Asian peris and uh, multi-grafted cherries are done. Peaches are just finishing up. One of my peach trees is a cocktail or so has uh, flowers finishing up. Okay. May have lost some of my figs, but some are coming on strong. Spoma has some good organic blends that are readily available at and reasonably priced. Um, so you recommend Albion and quinoa? The quinoa is a type of strawberry. Plus a few June borings set aside elsewhere. Yeah, I do like to have the not just the ever bearing, but also the June bearing. I think there's a night it's a nice pairing of the strawberries. However, Mar de Bois acts as both, and you really don't need, it seems like, a June bear. It just has a non-stop fruiting habit. It fruits a lot in June, and then it pauses for three weeks, and then it fruits the rest of the year all the way to frost. It's insane. Uh, CT, isn't that Chad? I'm not mistaken. What's going on? I haven't talked to you in a long time. You gotta tell me what kind of figs you like recently. I didn't even talk to you after the end of this last year, I don't think. Um, are you still on the forum? Mr. Green said, I do not use aluminum sulfate. It's easy to mix aluminum sulfate, uh, mix 
mix up with ammonium sulfate for blueberries. I don't know what the uh, the chemical is, to be honest with you, for the blueberries, but my soil here is so acidic as it is, it's actually at six, just a standard six. I have a clay soil at six. It's very strange, but the blueberries love it. Um, so they grow really well here. I f actually think my yard would be a really good place for a blueberry orchard. As weird as that sounds, um, out of all the things, I think probably blueberries would do best here at, than anything because we have acidic soil everywhere in the yard. Um, we have a ton of rain, so they'll never dry out, and they just seem to do extremely well here. We they, they don't really, the frosts don't seem to really bother them all that much. And, uh, yeah, it seems like a no-brainer to me. I mean, there is an orchard down the road, and they don't even grow blueberries, which I find to be pretty strange. Uh, maybe they have a more basic soil than what I have. Let's see here. What else we got? Where are we at? Alpine strawberries, smaller but sweeter, says Seamus. Seamus Foy. Yeah, you're right. They're incredible, aren't they? They really are nuts. Jersey Bob, Espoma, yeah, we, okay, we, we said that. Uh, mangoes, bananas, citrus. Pamela said, uh, Pamela said that I envied you guys so many varieties of fruits, berries, figs, etc. here in the Caribbean. We don't have those varieties of fruits. We have different varieties of mangoes, citrus, cherries, etc. Yeah. I mean, you guys like, you guys have a pretty good diverse set of fruits though, don't you? Um, we can't grow those, you know? So you can't grow what we grow. We can't grow what you grow. So I find it's a shame we can't all grow everything, but it is what it is. Mr. Green said, I have a wild mulberry tree in my area. It's still dormant. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, some of them really do just stay dormant a very long time. And the giant mulberry trees, you're right, just create a mess. And they attract S SWD. Birds love it. It's insane. Probably not a good thing to have. Um, at least an ornamental mulberry that's that big. You, Jersey Bob, puts dandelions in his coffee. How does that work? Nick said, I know you talked about trying to colonize the fig wasp. Ever think about growing a capper fig and using a wire to try to hand pollinate? Would it work? Yeah. Uh, what's his face? P Peter Lee. What's his face? <laughs> Peter Lee on Facebook and I think on our figs posted photos of him successfully doing that and he's in New Jersey. So he did it. He got the capper fig pollen and then pollinated his uh, his figs. And they ripened main crop. I think it was his desert king that ripened main crop. Dandelion roots for slow roasting and grinding into a coffee blend. Okay. Christopher is the same old dude. <laughs> Nothing, Nothing's ever new, Chris. Same old, same old. Um, Emma, hi, Ross. Any thoughts on growing cold, hardy citrus in the ground in Zone 7? I'm in the Northeast, like uh, like Thomasville Citran Quad or Mor uh, Morton Citran. Do you know of anyone with success? I did an episode of Fruit Talk on Cold Hardy Citrus. I think it really wasn't all that long ago. It was probably, I don't know, 
maybe 15 or so episodes before this one. I would look at that video because that has a lot, all the all the information that I can't recall at this current moment on cold hardy citrus. However, I do have a, a citrus variety in the ground here. It's a seedling of flying dragon. Um, however, it's a selected seedling that has supposed to have better fruit quality to it. I forget the name of it. I got it from Cliff England at England's Nursery, and he can sell you some seeds, and you can grow that in Zone 7. The issue is, is the fruit quality going to be worth it? Through my research, I found that there really was no citrus yet that has good fruit quality and can survive here. So, unfortunately, you have to really go to crazy lengths if you're going to grow them here uh, in the ground. There are people who I have spoken to on places like the Tropical Fruit Forum who have... Uh, hundreds if not thousands of seedlings of um, crosses between flying dragon and types of yuzu and types of citrange and just all kinds of weird types of citrus to f try to find something and breed something that is very hardy and I thought whoever was I don't remember the person's name I could find out who it is if I wanted to but that person's doing some really awesome work, I'll tell you that. Um, Jersey Bob, do dwarf citrus and pots, uh, yeah, just bring them in in the fall and out in the spring. Yeah, you can do that, and that's what I do. Jersey Bob says he has a clementine dwarf and a blood orange dwarf that doing they're doing well. Yeah. Um, I actually have a couple videos too, if Emma, if you're interested on growing them in pots, but I don't think that was really what you were trying to find out. Uh, Mr. Green said, witness protection, move to Florida, just know we're cold, all right? What is that from? I just watched something with that in it. And I don't remember what it was. Was it Tiger King or something? What was that show or movie or something that I watched? Or was that Goodfellas? Yes, yeah, Goodfellas. <laughs> I think that's Goodfellas, yeah. Just know we're cold, all right? Oh, huh. uh, let's see here. All right. Uh, Death Vortex. What a name. Hey Ross, fairly new around here. I have my first cuttings that I've had under grow lights over the winter. Uh, do you recommend any sort of pruning or do we just let the first year cuttings do their own thing? You know what? Um, I have found that if you just sort of let them do their own thing, you're going to probably get the biggest root mass possible at the end of that first season. However, what you really inevitably want is a single stem, especially if you're going to grow them in pots. Um, or if you live in a very warm place that you want to grow them as a single stem and uh, that way they can form a tree. So at some point you want them really to focus on a lot of the growth into one very vigorous and healthy shoot. Um, if that's not the case, then you got to select, I would select one of them and probably prune out the rest. The other option is to do some rejuvenation pruning, which I talk a lot about. You can watch a video on that. And that is another really good technique that I use for all of my young cuttings that were freshly rooted. Just a year ago, I cut them all down to the base and let them re-sprout from a lower a lower height with healthier shoots and that forms a healthier base and therefore a healthier tree in the long run and um, I highly recommend you do that so there's many ways to go about it you know you could just let it go the first year and then the second year do the rejuvenation pruning and then select that one stem that's probably the best way to go about it that's, yeah, that's definitely the best way to go about it. 
Jersey Bob, row cover is lightweight and works well. Let's see here. Death Vortex said, uh, I'm in Canada. We're getting some flurries here and there this week. Still keeping my cuties and doors under my grow lights. All right. Yeah, I wanted to bring my cuttings outside earlier to get them up potted earlier because it's just a lot of work that I have to do in the spring. So this was sort of something that was already warm and I could get them uh, in their in their in the place that they're going to live in for the whole season at an earlier point. Also, I have them now underneath the low tunnels, and that I think is a great place for them to be growing. Seamus said, "Hey Ross, living in west of Ireland, never would have guessed that." Seamus, <laughs> new to growing figs, have a brava crop, and uh, on Dalmaty in the tunnel. So excited, worried I might do something to cause them to drop fruit. Well, as long as they're just uh, getting enough moisture, they ain't gonna drop fruit. You know, that's all it is. You gotta make sure that the soil has enough water in it. You'll be all right. You don't want the temperatures in there too warm, but you know, I think in Ireland you'd be all right. Norin said, I bet they, were, uh, they weren't watering them then. That seems most likely. Thanks for the insight. Yeah, you're welcome. Scott, do you have any plans to get honeybees? Um, I do. It's just uh, when? I don't know. But at some point in the future, yes. And I would love to, at some point, capture a swarm. I think that would be the most ideal scenario. But I don't know. Let's see if that's even possible in the future at some point. Uh, Mike said, Ross, do you recommend any places in the U.S. or Europe to do a fig tour, like a grape vineyard tour, but a fig rare variety fruit tree tour? Yeah, for sure. You can go to the USDA, and they can give you a tour uh, at UC Davis. Um, you could maybe know somebody and get a tour. You could go and visit Ponds in Majorca. You could go and visit uh, Paulo in Italy. Um, that is mostly it those are I think your options there's also some parks that probably have some trees like Bruce Park in California does um, best case scenario is you know somebody <laughs> you can get your own tour uh, yeah I don't know what a Yupon Holly is. Unreal Hijinx said that. That's a weird thing to do with your dandelions, I'll tell you that. But uh, getting them roots out of the ground is definitely better than keeping them in the ground. <laughs> All right, Steven said, uh, can a fig tree be pruned, fertilized, treated in the end of the summer? Specifically to stimulate it to produce more brave as the next spring. Uh, yeah, I think I think so. <clears throat> Let me double check. So I have Pons' book here. And I believe he mentions that in his book. Although he may not, and because this is a very common theory that exists, um, a lot of people have brought this up over the years. If I were to say off my own knowledge, I would say no. That doesn't make any sense. But I want to see what Pons has said here. What you really want for your bravas to form properly is you want the lignification process to happen properly. The better lignified they are, 
Um, during that process, they form the bravas. So if you have a good lignification process, which is probably not impeded by bravas, are impeded by fertilizer. So if you feed a lot, let's say nitrogen at the end of the season, you're only going to cause your tree to grow, which is the opposite of what you want, right? That's going to have the opposite effect on lignification. You're going to now have very green wood. And that's not what you want. <clears throat> yeah, no. There's nothing in here, at least, that I, rem I remember. There is a type of pruning that you can do that uh, Pons recommends for Bravas. It's called Argent Argentile pruning. It's geared towards obtaining Bravas early, although this means sacrificing the autumn harvest in by fair varieties. It consists of removing all the wooden terminal or apical buds at the onset of the vegetative cycle, eliminating all wooden axillary buds from the branch after a few days and keeping two in the basal part. So you basically take off the tips, um, but you would leave the breva, the wood for the breva, and the brevas would form along with the um, shoots that are a lateral shoot that's along the branch along the branch where the brevas are uh, because they're at the end of the branch it says here the aim is to get a larger breva normally found at the end of the branch the pruning takes place at the beginning of the growing season of the fig tree around february or march yeah so you would basically just prune off the uh the tip at the beginning of the season and it would force a lateral shoot rather than the growth from a tip because the growth from that tip is going to produce a lot of fruit of main crop and the energy is going to be focused there away from the bravas therefore if you took away that tip you have more energy focused on the bravas and have larger bravas <clears throat> Tarek said, uh, thoughts on the Great Black Fig. Saul Harvey's video, it looks fantastic. Last episode of Fruit Talk, we mentioned the Great Black Fig because uh, I agree. Quite an underrated fig, I guess, that uh, somehow people are getting, uh, getting, I guess, knowledge of. I don't know. Maybe it was me. I, I don't, how did you hear about it, Tarek? Did you just find out through, through watching his videos? Um, I guess that's what you just said. But, um, yeah, no, I agree. I don't know if it's common, uh, nor does Harvey. Um, unfortunately, it comes from a, a collector named Andreas, and a lot of the Andreas varieties were never proved to be common. Um, a lot of people gave up on them. I am still growing one of them. It's called Sanguinato. And uh, a friend of mine said it was common, so because of that, I ended up acquiring it, um, but we'll see. It's been dropping fruit for me, and it just may take some number of years. So I don't know. Is it better to prune fig trees in a bush or single-stemmed shape, says Stuff and Things? Depends on where the tree is planted. If it's in a pot, you want them as a single stem tree. If you live in a very warm climate, you also want them as a single stem tree. Otherwise, if they're in the ground in a cold climate, you want them as a bush because that's naturally what's gonna happen. Anyway, um, I find them to be much more productive as a tree. Um, however, if you're doing them in a very high density, you might be better off doing them as 
some sort of a spyer or even very densely packed bushes. Norin said, I have one fig on my LSU gold that has a completely open eye. Has anyone ever counted that? Is it a defect and should I remove it from the energy? That's interesting. So like right now it's green and hard and, and you're saying it has an open eye. Um, yeah, I would, you know, you don't really know. You don't really know what's going to happen with that fig. Um, it could plug the eye with honey. A lot of the LSU golds have a big eye anyway. Um, or at least they really don't do well with moisture. And honestly, it's not really a great recommendation for anybody in a place that is in a very humid place. I know it's an LSU variety, so you would think it would do well in, in um, you know, a humid place, but there are other figs that are better than LSU gold, unfortunately, for a climate like that. If you live in a very dry place, uh, you know, I don't know. It's really, it's a tough one, man. You know, it's kind of up to you. Uh, Kim said, hey, Ross, can you tell us more about your Calabrese side of the family? Just curious if you visited them and would you like to? Any Calabrese dishes that you love? Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, I never met them. Uh, my grandparents have visited them. And I'll tell you this, <laughs> my grandfather told me at Christmas time, <laughs> a very weird thing, because I was asking about my family and what they were like and uh, what my grandfather's parents were like and what his parents, those parents were like and, um, you know, what kind of people they were like, what, 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 uh, what kind of attributes and things that they have and all that. Anyway, I come to find that a lot of the people in the town that my family is from, uh, they all look the same. A lot of them look very similar uh, because they basically their family tree is so tight knit that uh, he was. My grandfather was telling me that he has an uncle that is dead. But he went back to his hometown and swears that he saw a 20-year younger version of his uncle. Exact. Like, he couldn't believe it. Um, so I guess that's an interesting little thing. <laughs> Is that uh, the, everybody looks the same. Um, yeah. I'll tell you this. I haven't been to Italy, but I'd love to go. Um, I like spicy food and I think that's uh, one of the things that the Calabrians actually um, eat a lot of and my grandfather eats a lot of spicy food um, especially when he was younger and I guess I, I don't even know if you can have genetics for it but um, certainly have a higher tolerance for capsation than, uh, than most people Uh, that's all I got. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Ashton said, I've seen some of your videos on organza bags to protect peaches, but it seems like a huge hassle. Yeah, it is. Do you also use a spray regimen? No. You can. And uh, it depends on the diseases, man, in your area and if you're selling them. You know, if you're going to sell the stuff, you got yourself a lot of the... Uh, uh, what is that fruit, that insect? Uh, it's escaping me. The one that affects, oh, plum cacurlio. <laughs> I was thinking the one that affects plums, and it's called plum cacurlio. So, yeah, if you have a lot of plum cacurlio, you, you could be in a lot of trouble. What you need to look out for is if you got the plum cacurlio and you can recognize that, you may want to spray. What I did is to lessen the numbers and the future numbers, it actually decreased. Last year I had almost no plum curlio. The year before is really the first year I saw it. What you need to do is if they have infected fruits with the plum curlio and they fall from the tree, pick them all up and dispose of them. Uh, don't, with any fruit, 
big recommendation for pest management, disease management, is do not let any of the fallen fruits stay on the ground. Pick up every fallen fruit that you have. But yeah, surround's a good one, as Michael said. You know, it, it really depends on what you're willing to do. Uh, let's see. Mary2 on YouTube said, Are there good ways to find people locally that are growing figs so that I can trade cuttings with them? Uh, yeah, I would just join like rfigs.com or a Facebook group, and you'll eventually meet and talk with people who very, who live near you. And um, yeah, you'll you'll eventually make friends with them, and you can trade with them. Um, there's, believe it or not, I was in Princeton the other day. I know there's a couple of you guys that I'm already friends with that are in Princeton. I know there's some of you guys who watch my videos that are in Princeton. But I was at a park in Princeton um, a couple weeks ago. And believe it or not, there was a um, home that was sort of a part of the park. It was weird. I didn't really understand it. But there was somebody there who I didn't know. I didn't know who lived there. But they had fig trees out front in many pots of different sizes and different colors, different ages. And you could tell that um, the person was into figs. So small world. Um, within probably within 30 miles nah 30 miles let's say let's say yeah let's say let's say tw let's say about a 15 mile radius from me um there's a lot of people growing figs and you would never know it um you really would never know it um okay Steven said, thank you. Then if a branch stays green over the winter and does not fully lignify and makes a fig on the green part uh, the next spring, is that not a true Braba? No, uh, it's still a Braba. It's, it can happen, but I would imagine that if you're getting, if you're getting the lignification process perfect, you probably are going to have more Brabas. And uh, I've seen that at least here in my, my yard. Um, especially from year to year when I didn't have good lignification and then I started getting better and better and better lignification like last year was like perfect it was insane how some some of the lignification was um, especially for somebody in a humid place but I would say that uh, there's even a big debate as to what is the perfect amount of lignification and I would like to really find that out one day is uh, you know there at least my opinion of it is that it goes from green to green and hard to then slightly brown then to brown then to fully brown and then at brown it actually starts to shrivel once it gets even further lignified and it can get to a really varying degrees of shriveled and I think if it's shriveled it's fully lignified but if it's just brown and not shriveled I actually think it's not fully lignified um, but then again I don't know that's just the theory and uh, like I know like I said I'd like to have more um, more thoughts on it Yep, Jersey Bob, you're right. One stem per gallon is a good rule of thumb. Um, Ronald said, thank you so much for your info. You're welcome. We uh, would have taken me many, many years to learn everything on your channel. Australia does have a lot of figs, not just brown turkey. It's true. But you have a lot of brown turkeys there by other names. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of <laughs> I've seen a lot of photos of brown turkey. I'm like, why are you guys just not calling it brown turkey? But it doesn't, you know, everywhere is the same place with brown turkey. Everybody is just hysterical over that fig with the names. 
Michael said, I build a bin to put the container figs with holes in the side of the container and wood chips compost to heat up. Do you think I should try it or just build a poly tunnel? If you can build a poly tunnel, I'd build a poly tunnel. I think that is a legitimate though great way to do it. And I remember I think we talked about that. I don't know if you got the idea from <clears throat> from me or not, Michael, but there was a guy who on our figs posted something very similar with wood chips and he did that in his wood chip piles. But a compost pile would be really really good. People do that with their melons, you know, they get their melons off to a really great start. Um or even their seedlings off to a great start. Like Charles Dowding has a whole compost pile with seedlings on top of it. <clears throat> um, I'm going to um, call it a day um, here, guys, in a, in a little bit here. So I'm going to finish all the questions that are left, and then we're going to end the live stream. Um, just because I'm getting tired here. Um, so let's see. Okay, Tarek was getting back to me about that. Norin said, yes, it's only about a 1 4th to 3 8 diameter, so still very green. I'll try plugging it in after it hasn't rained for a few days and see what happens. The eye is about the diameter of a toothpick. Yeah, you'll be all right. I would just see what happens. I think it'll be an interesting learning experience, right? <clears throat> they should be closed at this point, yeah. Mike says, can dirt excavation in a new home development, which creates a lot of blowing dust, carry the fig rust disease? Or is it started with cool temps and moisture only? So if the disease is present in your area and there's a tree that has the disease and it's blowing, I guess, the air in that direction of your tree, <laughs> and it's also very moist, for an extended period of time, I don't see why you couldn't get it. But it's not like it's a permanent thing either. Fig rust will go away, you know, over the years. I find that I may have an outbreak one year um, from people who have it. And then I get it because they sent me a tree, as an example, and they had it. But, um, the following year, if you pick up all the leaves that fall, you really don't have it anymore. It's pretty. It really is a lot less serious. Um, and we've talked about silica as well, Mike, a lot. The silica is really underrated for rust. I'm telling you, Christian, what's going on, buddy? He said, "I didn't know you were Calabrese, lol." My dad is. You know what town your family's from? You love it there, man. I got I got started growing stuff after I went. Everyone is growing fruit in the yards. No way. Um, I do. I just don't know how to pronounce the name of the town. <laughs> oh man, I think it's called uh, Roshana Gravina. Maybe I'm saying the first part of it wrong. Something Ravina, I think, at the end. Uh, let's see. Nick said he's also Calabrese. Uh, we get the love for growing things from our Italian ancestors. Yeah, that's what happened. There is a genetic inheritance, but specifically for a capsation tolerance, I don't know. Jersey Bob said he serviced their backup generator at Princeton University back in the 90s. Mystery Man, great info, Ross. Thanks for the uh, thanks from Melbourne. All right. I'd like to go to Melbourne one day. I know they have the Australian Open there. And uh, I like tennis quite a bit. Brent said, I saw an Italian black at my in my local nursery, low and bushy, but couldn't find a fig bud anywhere. What's the deal with that variety? Yeah, you're right. Italian black is like a, very similar to a black mission. And black mission figs, for the most part, uh, take a number of years before they will shake off their hormonal imbalance and actually fruit. 
they like to grow and grow and grow for a number of years before they finally slow down and put out some fruit. It's not a variety I really recommend, I'll tell you that. Um, Jersey Bob. My damps and plums seem to be doing quite well so far. You know, I'd like to try some different plums. I really would like to get my green gauge plum to fruit for me. It seems like my Italian prune plum is actually going to have some fruit on it this year. So that's exciting. You know, it was weird, actually. My Italian prune plum flowered well later than all my other plums and most of my stone fruits. So that could be one in the future that is worth growing um, but that's a different type of plum that again is for prunes and uh, I would like to try it AC said last year I had an ant infestation on my peach tree do you have a, a pest control suggestion yeah get um, crap it's the stuff for slugs basically you get yourself some tin foil you wrap it around the base of your tree the trunk of the tree on top of the tin foil, you put on this stuff. Uh, I'm going to be using it this year, especially if I'm going to sell fruit. I don't want the ants getting holes in my figs. So I'm going to put that on the tin foil around my figs. I can't remember the name of it. It's for slugs, it's for ants. Um, it, basically, when they crawl up the products that is on the tin foil, they basically die. Oh, yeah, Tanglefoot. There you go. Thank you, Vivian. Perfect. That's it. Mr. Man said, I'd love to have some of those varieties here in Melbourne. Weather here is also quite strange this year. You still have some trees putting out new figs. Yeah, it's crazy, man. The weather is just nuts. Jersey Bob, my mulberries took some damage from the frost last night. It was a kiwi I started last year. Yeah, the kiwi, man. They got, Mine got punished. Stuff and things. You know anything about Pachoto? I can't seem to find much info on it. Yeah, well, it's from uh, Thierry. So if you go to his website, he's the only one with any information on it. So figs, figu de monde, and you'll see, type in Pachoto. And this is one that I'm growing. Um, and this is all the information on it. Now I did, uh, I think it was this one, or I maybe I thought against it. But it does look a lot like uh, a fig I already have with this with a similar drying capability to it. But... I don't know it's probably not and then therefore I decided to go after it so you can see this is the description here in English seems pretty good right um, but a lot of the figs as he mentions in the bandle areas where it's from I don't think they get a lot of rain yeah it says here it rains very rarely and then therefore a lot of them dry on the tree and um, so who knows if it's going to have good drying capabilities in a humid place, but uh, it's worth a shot, right? What happened to the uh, chat? Okay, here we go. Yeah, thanks for joining in, Mystery Man. Yeah, no problem, Ashton. Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, let's see here. Good night, Vivian. Thank you, everybody here for joining me on this episode. Um, again, I'd like to thank you guys. It's always fun doing these live streams. If I, you know, I'm a little exhausted, like I said, in different parts of this video <laughs> from uh, just not getting enough sleep last night. But um, 
yeah, I would like to do this more often. I hope to see you guys at the next one uh, for the next episode of Fruit Talk. I think uh, you guys, if you haven't already, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Check out our blog, Fig Boss. Um, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. By the way, on Facebook, we have a Facebook page. A lot of people send me friend requests on Facebook, and that's just my personal account. Yeah, that's it right there. Rogiano Gravina, I think that's the name of it. Anyway, um, check us out, guys, over there. And, and uh, yeah, we'll see you guys for tomorrow's episode um, of what's to come with these low tunnels. It's really going to just describe the building process of the whole thing. It's so, so simple. And you can really beef it up more than what I did. And um, that's actually my plan with some of this is to open this up but um, or beef it up a little bit. But anyway, yeah. Thank you guys, and uh, good night, everyone. We'll see you guys soon, all right? Take care.